want us to go into our second part of our series that we've been in called Compelled by the Cross. And last week, Pastor Patrick, he talked about compelled by the cross using the two thieves that were crucified with Christ, one on his right and one on his left. And he talked about how that the repentant thief, he literally was compelled by the cross by three different things. Number one, he was compelled by the fear of God. Number two, the mercy of God. And number three, the grace of God. And so this morning, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about some other characters in the Bible. And they, too, were compelled by the cross. And we're going to talk about Peter and the disciples. Today, we're going to be in the book of John, chapter 21. So if you want to follow along with me this morning, please uh, do, the, do that with me. So I want you to go ahead. If you have your sermon outline, your notes with you, we're going to go ahead and fill out the very first line, if you will. And it says, Jesus reveals himself to his disciples. Now, John chapter 21, as we look at verse 1 through 14, we find that this chapter here starts exactly with that. Jesus reveals himself to his disciples. Now, you have to understand that this was after Jesus had been crucified. This was after Jesus was laid in the tomb. This was after he was resurrected from the dead. And this was after he had shown himself to the disciples on several occasions. So I want us to look at John chapter 21 and verse 1. I'm sure you'll have it on the screen here as well. It says this, after this, Jesus revealed himself. Somebody say revealed. revealed. He revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. This is the Sea of Galilee. So they're in Galilee. And he revealed himself. Say revealed. revealed. He revealed himself again in this way. So the word there, reveal, is mentioned two different times. But anytime you see a word like that in scripture that's mentioned twice, get ready because there's an emphasis with those words. Something is important for you to take notice of. And so if we look at the word reveal in the Greek, it is by the name of phanera, which means to show or to make manifest or to make visible or to become known or to be plainly recognized or to be thoroughly understood. But here's my question. Why did Jesus have to reveal himself to the disciples again? Did he not know the disciples before? Did the disciples not know Jesus before? Why in the world is he having to reveal himself again? What's the big deal about revealing? And so I think that when we start looking at this, we have to understand that, the, that Peter and his disciples, they truly did not understand the power or the significance of the cross. They just didn't get it. In fact, all after all that they had been through together with Jesus, Jesus had spent the last three years with them, training them. I mean, they walk with him, they talk with him, they learn from him, they, they literally experience miracles by him. He, they were called by him. And so here we see that, that he's even spoken to them and he's saying, look, I'm telling you right now that I am going to be arrested. I'm telling you, disciples, that I'm going to, to die a, a, a horrible, agonizing death. I'm telling you right now that I am going to rise again on the third day. But for some reason, it just didn't click. It just didn't connect with the disciples, the power of what was going to happen on the cross. They just missed it. And so now they're standing on the seashore of Galilee and they're asking themselves these questions. They're in this fog, they're in this mist, they're in this funk, if you will. And they're in a confusion and they start asking themselves maybe questions like this. What have I done? What were those three years of my life all about anyway? Where is Jesus now? What am I supposed to do now? Where am I supposed to go now? They're on the seashore, they're in Galilee. And so they're, they're just out of their mind. They don't understand. Jesus has been crucified. He's laid in the tomb. Yet he's revealed himself to them back and forth. But, but something has changed in their perspective about what's going on around them now. Which leads us to the first point here is that the disciples didn't understand why they were even in Galilee. They had no idea why they were even there. But if we look at Mark chapter 14 and verse 28, it says this. Jesus is speaking here. He says, but after I am raised from the dead, he said, I will go ahead of you to Galilee and I will meet you there. Is that plain as day? 
Jesus just simply put it right out there for them. But here's the problem. They heard it. They should have received it. But I think they just, with everything going on around them, all the, tra the tragedy that was taking place, I think they just forgot that Jesus had said that. This is not on the screen this morning, but in Matthew chapter 28, we see where Jesus even told the disciples to meet him in Galilee. You see, after Jesus was uh, resurrected, he was there in the tomb or by the tomb in the garden. And Mary Magdalene was standing there as well. And so she walks up to this man and she mistakes him for a gardener. And she begins to look at this man and all of a sudden she recognizes that this was Jesus. And she says, Rabboni, which means teacher. And he says, Mary, I want you to go and tell Peter and the disciples, I want to meet them in Galilee. So they had no excuse to understand why they were in Galilee, but they just were missing it. You see, Jesus had a plan. How many of you know God always has a plan? Yeah. He always has a plan. Just as God wasn't surprised what happened in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve, he's not surprised at your downfalls or your failures or your slip ups or your denials either. God always has a plan to get us back on the right track if we are willing over the years in ministry, I've seen countless numbers of people who were once on just really a great path for God. People who were on fire for God. I mean, literally prayer warriors connected in the church, involved in everything they could get their hands in. I mean, they just were loyal to work for the Lord. But then a tragedy struck in their life. And it seemed as if they were, instead of moving towards the one that, that would comfort them in the midst of that tragedy or the one who had walked with them in trials. It seemed as if the one that, that they had been telling everybody else and counseling everybody else what to do in the midst of a trial, what to do in the midst of a tribulation or a tragedy. Now they're finding themselves in a tra tragedy themselves. Now they're thinking, you know what? I'm just coming away from Jesus. I'm coming away from the church. I'm coming away from the body of Christ. And I feel as if I am lost. And I am alone. It reminds me of a story that many of you probably remember for years, but it's about a man who had a dream. He was walking on the beach with the Lord. And as they walked, he saw flashbacks of life or his life in the sky. And for each flashback, there was one set of footprints in the sand. And it bothered him to see that there was only one pair of footprints. You see, those one pair of footprints were in the most difficult times in his life. And he said, Lord, you said as long as I walk with you or you were walking with me, I, I, I knew that you were going to be with me, but you were not there. I only see one set of footprints. But then the Lord said to the man, the years that you have seen only one set of footprints is what I carried you. You see, listen, when a, when a tragedy hits your life, I've been there and you have too. But when a tragedy hits your life, or failure, or slip-ups, or denials. Nothing can take God's presence away from you. He doesn't desert us in times of trouble. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. And that's easy for us to hear, but it's so hard for us to take. Why? Simply because sometimes we look at the problem that takes priority or precedence and, and, and that's our form of looking at everything now is through those lens. And therefore we wallow in our pain and then we continue on in our past. You see, these disciples are doing that very same thing. In fact, they are numb to their responsibilities now. You say, what responsibilities? Well, these disciples were called by Jesus. In the very beginning of the New Testament, you see where Jesus comes along with some fishermen. And he says, follow me and I will make you. Fishers of, Fishers of men. So they were called by Jesus. They were loyal followers, but they were called to do a work for the Lord. He not only called them to be fishers of men, but also he called them to be shepherds of men. In other words, to take care of the flock, to shepherd the flock, to uh, nurture the flock, to watch over the flock. But there's still 120 believers that are out there during this time. And here the disciples are all scattered all over the place. You got four of them here and you got seven of them over here and they're scattered. And the 120, these are the same 120 that are found in Acts chapter or, or Acts, the very beginning of Acts 
on the day of Pentecost. You remember they were there to wait on the promise of the Father, which was the Holy Spirit coming upon them. Well, before that happened, here they are waiting for the disciples to lead them, to guide them. But the disciples, through the tragedy and through all the stuff they're going through, they begin to just become numb and become just to the point where they seem to be coming away from their calling. They're not fulfilling what they used to do. They're not as on fire for Jesus as they were before. Come on, somebody. Tragedy hits your life and something changes in us. Something happens. And we either draw closer to him or we go so much further away from him. What do you do in those times? You see, we, we find that they are doubtful about their future. Peter says in verse 3, I'm just going to say the very first part of the scripture. But Peter comes out and he says, all right, guys, we're out here on the seashore. And, and, and we don't know what's going on. We don't know what to think, what to say. Jesus has died. He's, he's rose again. He's appeared to us a couple of times. But, but it just seems so confusing. So guys, I'm going fishing. Come on, man, say amen. When everything else gets bad in your world, go fishing. Right? Do something that you enjoy. Well, guess what? Peter, it wasn't that he enjoyed fishing so much, but you know what Peter did? Peter just went back to the comfortable way of life. Instead of going forward and moving towards Jesus saying, yes, I've had a tragedy, but I'm going to keep on moving because he's called me to this and I can't let him down and I've got to serve him and I've got to tell others about him. We find Peter just goes fishing. In fact, he looks over and he sees a boat and he sees a net in it and he's thinking, man, guys, come on. And the disciples, surely they fall suit with Peter and they get in the boat and they go out and they fish. You see, what I've learned about this is that in the Greek, this very verse three, it's like Simon Peter literally said this, I am going back to fishing. Mm. Somebody say back. Yeah. You see, he's going backwards instead of forward. And so there's an indication that he's going back to his old life of fishing for fish. That's not what Jesus called him to do. He called him to be fishers of yeah. men, not fishers of fish anymore. But can you blame them? They're on an emo emotional roller coaster, if you will. One moment they're riding this tidal wave of excitement as Jesus triumphant entrance into Jerusalem. The next thing they're grieving over Jesus' death. And then they're overwhelmed by the confusion that, that the women come to them and say, hey, by the way, Jesus is alive. And he says, meet him in Galilee. And by the way, he's appeared to them a couple of times. He's walked through walls, if you will. He's come to them one time and met with the disciples. And then the second time, Doubting Thomas wasn't in the first meeting. Come on, somebody. Yeah. If you don't come to the first meeting, you're missing something, aren't you? Yeah. So Thomas had to go to the second meeting. So he came and there was Jesus. So if you don't come next Sunday, you better come the next Sunday. You've got to know that when Thomas was there that second time, he recognized this is Jesus. You see, they were overwhelmed by seeing Jesus. But here's the thing. It was an inconsistent seeing Jesus. It wasn't consistent the way that they used to be with Jesus. Yeah. Now he's appearing to them and then he's leaving them. He's appearing to them and he's leaving them. And so now they just feel lost. They feel all alone. He's not the consistency that they remember. We find that next they are blinded by their failures. Remember back when Peter was very arrogant and he, he said, you know what, Jesus, I will never forsake you. And what did Jesus say? Peter, before the cock crows this night, you're going to turn me off. Right? Leave one and one. That's what he said. You're going to turn me off. You're going to deny me three different times. And what did he do? He denied the Lord three times. You see, and after that, all the disciples begin to run away. Where are they at now? And, and, and now what do they do? And what, what do you find them doing now? We find them going back to what was comfortable. Going back to the old lifestyle. Going back to simply fishing. You know what they did? They went back fishing and they fished at night. They went back fishing and they didn't catch anything. And about this time, their minds were as dark as the night and their lives were as empty as their nets. Have you ever had a bad situation or a bad tragedy happen in your life? And the old you would have looked to other things that you knew that would never fulfill you or always left you empty. 
But even though you learn from those things and you grew from your past, somehow, even today, even though you've grown as a Christian, somehow when a tragedy hits our life, we still will revert back to those things that we know don't even fulfill us anymore. But it's just comfortable. I've known people who are alcoholics that would be sober for, for maybe six months or even more. But when a tragedy hits their life, what's the first thing that they want to do? Go back to what they thought fulfilled them. Or, or somebody that's a drug addict, they do the very same thing. I'm off of this. I'm away from it. But a tragedy hits. It's the first thing that they think about because that was what used to comfort them. And it's familiar and it's comfortable. And I know about it. I think about people who run around with the wrong crowd or get around the wrong people or the wrong friends, if you will. It's the same situation here. Think about who you're running around with and when a tragedy hits your life, those are not the people you want to run back to. Somebody say amen. amen. That's not the people you want to go to. You want to go to the people who are going to encourage you and help you to get through the battle. Yeah. I'm sorry I'm spitting on the front row. <laughs> Give a little sip of water, Tony. Here we go. That's holy water coming out, John. Right <laughs> Listen, we look at verse 4. Let's take a look at this. Jesus shows up, and the disciples don't recognize him. Verse 4 says this. Just as the day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. So often we live our lives in condemnation because of our past faults and our past failures, and our flaws, and our mess-ups, and our screw-ups. And then Jesus shows up at a moment in our lives that he says, I love you. I want you to know that I'm here for you right now. I'm, 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 I'm wanting to show my grace towards you and my mercy towards you. And he's saying, it is I, guys. I'm here. It's me. But because we cannot forgive ourselves of our past, we don't recognize his presence or even think that he can forgive us of our past. It's good. The Bible says there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Jesus Christ. The Bible says, the Bible says, I'm about to preach up here, hang on. The Bible says that he whom the Son sets free will be what? Free indeed. That while we were yet still in our sins, Jesus still died for us. That's amazing. So we see that the disciples were in this funk, and they didn't know why they were even in Galilee. But now we see that the disciples didn't even understand the significance or the power of the cross. Right before Jesus went to the cross, what were the disciples doing? They were arguing over who was the greatest among them, right? They're, they're literally, they're, they're, their agendas had literally deafened their spiritual ears to Jesus' true message. Jesus is now coming to them for the third time. Remember the first two. Now this is the third time. And every time he appeared to them, he's trying to get their eyes open so that they can see that the cross is literally the crossroads of humanity. You see, here's the deal. The cross reveals who Jesus really is. If you don't mind, I want to preach here for about two seconds, okay? Here's the deal. The cross reveals the, 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 who Jesus really is. Because if the cross couldn't keep Jesus in the grave, then he is the son of God. Amen? Amen? Then he is the second person of the Trinity. He is the bread of life. He is the good shepherd. He is the door to the father. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the way maker. He is the, the, the chain breaker. He is the deliverer. He is the one who sets you free. He is all of those things. And we recognize those things. Listen, he bore all those things that we have to endure here on this earth. He bore all of our sickness and our sin and our disease on the cross at Calvary. And through that sacrifice, I can be free. Yeah. I think we ought to take five seconds and just praise him. Yeah. And just even praise if you understand what I mean by that. I want you to understand that the cross has power, but the disciples just didn't get it. And he's trying to reveal this to them. The cross reveals the validity of Jesus' true message. Jesus predicted his death and his burial and his resurrection. And if that impossible prediction came true, then that means that everything that is found in the word of God, come on somebody, it is true. If he said it, then it must be true. 
Because these things came to pass. The cross shows the depth of God's love. I think about these two ladies right here that got baptized this morning. I'm sitting there staring at them, and I'm trying not to cry this morning. I'm trying. It's hard, Dolan, wherever Dolan is. I'm trying, brother. <laughs> but the cross, the cross shows the depth of God's love. John 3, 16. For God so loved Lee Smith. For God so loved Audrey Smith. <laughs> See what I did there? <laughs> For God so loved Caleb and Ham. For God so loved Ginger. For God so loved Kathy. Yeah. For God so loved me. And he loved you. That he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him should not perish. But have everlasting life. Amen. That is the death of the meaning of the world. That's what it should feel like. That clapping that you're doing, that ought to make you think, oh my God, i got to get to the cross. I need that. That depth of his love for me. Some people don't even know what true love is and they're searching in all the wrong places. But when you come to the cross, there is love, everlasting love. The cross shows Jesus unlimited power. When Jesus healed the sick, he showed his power over disease. When he claimed the, or when he uh, calmed the storm, he showed his power over nature. When he fed the 5,000, he declared his power over poverty. And the cross declared simply his ultimate power over death, hell, sin, and the grave. 1 Corinthians 15, 55. It says this, O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? Yeah. And it goes on to say, your victory is found in the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. Romans 3 and verse 23. It says, for the wages of sin is, yeah. but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. When Jesus died on the cross, when he rose again on the third day, he conquered death, hell, sin, and the grave. He did it all on the cross. The cross reveals his love. Lastly, Jesus not only revealed himself to his disciples, fill in the blank here, Jesus restores his disciples. Pastor Tom and I talked last week, and, and apparently he and I have the, uh, the same kind of liking to a certain program that you find on some of the cable shows, and, and it's called Restoration or Kings of Restoration, but there's different programs. And I absolutely love, Josh, I love when something is old and it becomes new. When, when something is just in a graveyard, if you will, or a junkyard, and an old car or something, and, and I just look at it and I think there's no way. This guy's going to take that old car and turn it around and make it look good. And all of a sudden, you see it on that program, and you know it took him only one day to do it. Yeah. Right? That's television for you. So here we go. He takes this car, and he restores it and makes it look like new. I love when they take, like, an old gas pump or something, you know, from a long time ago, and it's all rusted out, you know, and some of the parts are missing on it. But they take that. And they restore it, put the right parts in there, and now it's working and it looks beautiful. I'm a motorcycle guy, so I love when they take the motorcycles. Come on, somebody. I love motorcycles. I love it when they take those and they just, it looks like it ain't never going to ride again. It ain't going to roll nowhere. But they take that motorcycle and they restore it, and it's a beautiful looking thing. Do you know that's what the disciples needed right now? They needed to be restored. Did you know that the Bible says that Jesus is the potter and we are the clay? Yes. Did you know that when a potter takes some clay and, and he places that clay on this round wheel, well, that, 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 that wheel there in the middle of that, it, it is literally the center of that rock, right? So you take that, that clay, he places it in the center of that rock. And what he does, he puts his hands around it and he begins to shape it and begins to mold that clay, right? You see some beautiful vessels that have come out of that. 
So as he's molding that, and he comes up, well, all of a sudden it starts breaking apart, and some areas are not exactly what the potter really wants it to look like. So it starts to crumble. But here's the thing. The potter never throws away the clay. Oh, I don't even, are you here this morning? He doesn't throw away the clay. He takes the same lump of clay, begins to mold it in his hands again, puts it right back on the center of that rock, and he turns that wheel, and all of a sudden he starts making it again into this beautiful vessel. He adds a little water, just like the Holy Spirit, when he's added to your life, you start getting straightened out a little bit. And so the Holy Spirit is now added, and that vessel begins to make its way up, and now it's got a little hook on the side where you can carry it around. Come on, mama, we can pour out some water. And so you've got this beautiful vessel, that in the beginning looked like all it needed to do was just be in a graveyard somewhere. It just needed to be of no use anymore. How many of you know the disciples needed to know they were useful again? They just felt like they were of not of any use anymore. And there's some of you sitting here this morning, you probably have felt in your own life, maybe you're there this morning, I just don't know if God can use me anymore. I just don't know if he wants to use me because of all the junk that I've got in my trunk. Come on, somebody. I don't know if he can use me, but I want you to know God wants to be in the midst of your pain. He wants to be right where you are, and he wants to mold you and shape you into his image and be exactly like he is. He will not throw you away. So when you think you're wanting to throw yourself away, he's going to come in the garbage and get you. He's coming after you. Oh, this is good stuff. Jesus. The next one of the blank is, is how does he do this? He res- or he refreshes their faith. Yes. He refreshes their faith. How does he do this? Number one, he does this with his presence. Jesus personally now goes to his disciples and he meets them right where they are. Right in their brokenness, right in their heartache, right in their confusion, right in their doubt, right in their anxiety, right in their fear. He meets them right where they are. And I want you to know this morning that Jesus wants to meet you right where you are. You don't have to be in a church service for Jesus to meet you. You don't. That doesn't mean you don't come to church. That's right. Just want to get that straight. He will meet you. It doesn't have to be in a church. It doesn't have to be on a first Wednesday service. It doesn't have to be on a capel night. It doesn't have to be in a revival tent meeting. It doesn't have to be there. How many of you know that Jesus will meet you in your car? Jesus will meet you at the food distribution. Jesus will meet you anywhere, in the shower, wherever, by your bedside. Jesus wants to meet you right where you are. Here's the thing. Jesus wants to meet you before the storm, in the midst of the storm, and after the storm. He wants to be with you the whole entire way. So quit pushing him away because he's not going anywhere. He loves you and he's he's got a plan for your life. Remember we talked about that already. If you're willing. Second thing we see is he refreshes their faith with his words. You see, he didn't need to to scream and yell at them like I'm doing at you guys this morning. He didn't need to, to go to Peter and say, Peter, what's your problem? Why did you deny me? Come on, you were with me for three years. I told you better than that. Peter, what are you doing? Why are you out here fishing for fish? What's your problem, Peter? Peter didn't need that. John, what's the deal? You've been laying up all on my breast telling me you love me. Telling me how wonderful I am. John, you ran off and left me in a time of need. He didn't do that. Why? Because they didn't need that. They were already defeated. They were already feeling down. They were already feeling like everything is over. It's done. There's no use anymore. Maybe you're here this morning and the world is yelling at you. Maybe your spouse is yelling at you. Maybe your children are yelling at you. Maybe your boss or your job is yelling at you. And everybody's yelling at you. But I know a Jesus who can speak to the noises of this world. And he speaks to it and he says, peace be still. And the winds and the waves obey his will. All the mess that we hear all around us that's trying to buy for our attention and move us this way and that way. Jesus says, you just be still. And you watch me work. In verse 5, he uses a term of endearment here. Listen to the encouragement. 
He says, children, do you have any fish? He could say children or boys or friends, but it was a term of endearment. He was saying to them, I love you. I have a deep love for you guys. They failed again. He said, what do you mean they failed again? Yeah, they, they failed on the seashore. They went back to fishing for fish. Jesus didn't tell them to do that, so they failed again. So what do they need right now? They need to know that apart from Jesus, they can do nothing. You see, I don't know if you realize this or not, but every time the disciples got a whole bunch of fish in their boat or in their net, did you know Jesus was there? Yeah. Did you know that when they fished without Jesus, they didn't catch anything? Yeah. Wow. Apart from Jesus, you can do nothing. And then we see they, that their faith was refreshed with his love. You see, there was a miracle catch that took place. Let's look at verse 6 very quickly. Verse 6 says, he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. They're out there fishing. They haven't caught anything. They've been fishing all that long with nothing in their nets. And what he's doing here is he's showing them that he loves them. He's showing them, I forgive you. I want you to know that maybe you abandoned me. Maybe you failed me. But I want you to know I love you. Amen. He's saying, let's start fresh. Let's start again. I don't know about you this morning, but simply this. I fail Jesus every day. But I'm grateful that his mercies are new every morning. When I wake up tomorrow morning, he's right there. I'm sorry, Lord. Oh, I got you. It's never a morning that I wake up that he's not right there by me. They needed to know that. They needed to know he's not only there and he's going to disappear again, but he's there. He's not going anywhere. And I love this part. Now we see in verse 7 that the disciples' eyes are beginning to be open. Now the cross is beginning to become more, more available to their mind. It's understanding more about it now. Verse 7. That disciple whom Jesus loved, therefore said to Peter. Now the disciple Jesus loved, or it says here in the scripture, that's John that we're talking about here. So John goes over to Peter and says, Peter, it's the Lord. Now, You've read about Peter. Can you imagine Peter? Shut up. <laughs> Peter was always speaking his mind, wasn't he? Sticking his foot in his mouth. He was always doing that. But John's saying, no, 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 no. no. I heard that voice. I don't even know when you've met Jesus, you know his voice now. And he, he recognized from the seashore a hundred yards away. Peter, I'm telling you, that's Jesus. That's our Lord. That's our master. That's our teacher. That's him. It's Jesus. And so his eyes began to be open to who this was that told them to cast their nets on the right side because it was a reminder of what they did in the very first time. I love the old chorus we used to sing in church. It says, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of this earth Oh, it says, and the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and his grace. When you keep your eyes on Jesus, other things start getting away from you. Like in a horse, you know, when you put that, that, that bit in his mouth and that pride on when you put all of that, and you put those on the sides of their eyes there, you've got to understand that they know now what's in front of them. And John recognized who was in front of him. The disciples' reaction is absolutely priceless. The latter part of verse 7 and verse 8, look at this. One of my favorite parts. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes. He would strip for work, and he threw himself into the sea. Now you got to think, Peter, he's now two for two, jumping out of boats. Right? He's jumping out of boats again. Remember what happened the first time he jumped out of the boat? What happened? He sank. This time, he's jumping out in the water. And all he knows is I'm going to keep my eyes on Jesus like I did the last time. Because when I put my eyes on him, he pulled me up out of that water and I began to walk towards him. Now he's out there in that water. Can you imagine, Peter? Man, he's swimming and he's looking straight ahead and he's pressing towards the goal. He's pressing towards the prize of the high calling of Jesus Christ. He's moving now and he's getting even closer. Can you imagine if you just keep your eyes on Jesus, everything's going to be all right. And Peter recognized that. 
John, you're right. It's Jesus. I'm going for it. Can you imagine the disciples going, um, uh, excuse me, there's fish in that boat? You know, I mean, come on, Peter, wait for us. <laughs> and he didn't care. Boy, if we could have some folks that got on fire for God like that. It's not that you're trying to forget everybody in your family or friends. You just got to get to the cross. Because you know something is there. You know something's going to turn your life around. And once you come to the cross and you lay down your burdens at the cross and you get forgiven at the cross, now you go back and get them and say, come on, fellas, I have something to show you. I got something I want to share with you today. So I love that about Peter. And then in verse 9, there was a miracle breakfast. It was enlightening. Verse 9, when they got out of the land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. This was not just an act of kindness that Jesus did for the disciples. It was done to help them recognize their time that was spent with Jesus. I mean, every encounter that he had with them was to remind them over the last three years of what they meant to each other. In fact, verse 10 even talks about participation. And he's telling them, hey, bring your fish with you because he wants them to add to what they have and bring that to the table as well. And then he not only refreshes their faith, but he reminds them of their calling. He does that by drawing on their memories. That miracle catch, the one that they got, it reminded them of the first time that they caught all those fish in the net room. That he's now reminding them of their calling. Remember, I called you to be fisher of men. I called you to be shepherds of men. He's reminding them of those things. And then he restores their vision and their purpose. Jesus is now gently correcting and nudging, and he's encouraging Peter and the disciples to get back on track of where you're supposed to be. Some of you here this morning, you've been off track for a while now, and it's time to get back on track. It's time to get back on the Jesus train. Amen? Amen. He's trying to get back where he wants you to be. You see, the cross, we're going to move through these. The cross changes attitudes. We're not going to put this on the screen scripture-wise, but in, in verse 15 and through 17, we see where Peter Jesus had confronted Peter, and he literally confronted his pride is what he did. And when he confronted him, he just basically said to him three things. Peter, do you remember? Do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Three times. Can you imagine sitting there on that beach or standing there on that beach and that charcoal fire that's there now? You see, he was helping them remember their last three years, remember what he had called them to do. Now, can you imagine Peter going back to when Jesus was on trial and he was standing by the charcoal fire and warming his hands? And now he's beginning to remember back where a woman came to him and said, you were one of those with this man. And he says, no, I was not. Leave me alone. Another, another person comes and says, you were with this man. I can tell by the way that you talk, you were one of them. I told you I don't know this man. And one more person comes by and they do the same thing and he curses and he says, I told you, this is not anything to do with me. I don't know who that is. And he went away. I find it interesting that at this moment, you can imagine the heaviness that was going on in Peter's heart. As Jesus says, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And the third time that he asked Jesus, did he love him? You know what he did the third time? The Bible says he grieved on the third time. I think it was because he realized that his love was lacking. I think he realized that, that he could feel the weight of his failures from the past. And Jesus is in essence saying this, Peter, if you love me, and I know that you do, then in humility, get your eyes off of yourself and do what I taught you to do. Do what I exemplified before you. Do the thing that I called you to do. Be like me. Care for others like me. Have a heart just like me. Live for me. Not just the version of faith of you, of yourself, but of me. And now Jesus is ready to fully restore Peter. And so he gives him his original call back. Secondly, the cross clarifies Peter's calling. Jesus all morning long is just simply loving on the disciples and they don't even realize it. He's showing them love. He's, he's fixing them breakfast. He's talking to them. He's loving on them. He's sharing with them. He's saying, listen, I've called you, and I've still called you. And I'm calling you now to get back to where you were. The cross is the foundation of preaching. We look at this very simply and say this. If there is no cross, there is no redemption. 
If there is no cross, there is no forgiveness. If there is no cross, there is no grace. And if there is no cross, there's no reason for me to be up here and preaching about Jesus. It just doesn't matter without the cross. On the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, verse 22 through 24, I believe we have this on the screen. I'll do this very quickly. I know we're running out of time. But this is where Peter is up now. And the one thing that Peter had struggled with this whole time that we've been studying this this morning is he had a problem and a struggle with the cross. Not understanding fully the significance and the power of the cross. But in Acts chapter 2, 22 through 24, I want you to hear what Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost and he preached. How many of you know he preached on the cross? He stood up in the midst of all these people. Listen to what he said. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. How many of you know God always has a plan? And you, with the help of wicked men, you put him to death by nailing him on the cross. But God raised him from the dead. This is Peter talking. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Peter preached on the cross. And guess what happened? The Bible says that there were some people that heard that word and they said, brethren, what should we do? And Peter said, hey, repent and be baptized and be filled with the spirit of God. And the Bible says 3000 souls were added to the church that very day. We get excited about one, two people getting baptized. 3,000 came to Jesus that day. What are we waiting on? What are we waiting on, community? Yeah. They're waiting on us. Right. Preach the cross and they will come. We need to preach the message of the cross. Yep. After he preached, what a powerful, powerful display of God's glory. The cross it gives power to transform. 1 Corinthians 1.18. It says to us who are being saved, it is the cross that is the power of God. And then lastly, the cross is the reason for Peter's appreciation. You see, Eusebius, who is a church historian, tells us that Peter... At the end of his life, he was killed, but he was killed in Rome. And he was scheduled to be crucified on a cross, just like Jesus was. And because of the impact of the cross had on Peter that we've been talking about, he did not want to die like his Savior. He did not feel worthy to be able to be crucified the way Jesus was. So I think we have a picture here that will show you this is how Peter decided to be crucified. He said, I do not feel worthy. To be able to be crucified like my Savior was. So he was crucified upside down. Can I tell you something this morning? That goes along with this message title. Peter was compelled by the cross. And my question to you this morning is simply this. Are you compelled by the cross? When I was a kid. We used to go to church every Sunday. I see my brother out there. Every Sunday morning, we went to church. Every Sunday night, we went to church. Every Wednesday night, we went to church. Anybody here follow me? Every revival, we went. Every gospel singing, we went to. Anytime the doors of the church were open, oh, something just happened. The devil get behind me. All right, then. Cross. 
The old rugged cross. Yes. When I surveyed the wondrous cross, yes. we would sing them all. And there were even more that I can't even imagine. Here we are, singing about the cross. But here was my problem. I just saw the cross. I just heard about the cross. I just sang about the cross. I just knew about the cross. But I had never come to the cross. You can come to church all you want. Sing all the worship songs you want. But without the cross, you have nothing. One day I finally realized that there was a meaning to the cross. And I remember I found out who died on the cross. And I found out why he died on the cross. And I, and I began to realize that he died on the cross for me. And it was at that moment that I was like Peter. I made a beeline to the cross. And I went down and I knelt down and I laid my burdens and I laid my guilt and I laid my shame and I laid my old friends and I laid everything in my past. All of those things. I laid them at the foot of the cross. And you know what happened? His blood that was shed washed away all my sins. Somebody here this morning, have you come to the cross or do you just know about the cross? Have you had a connection with what happened on the cross? I want you to know this morning that this is a great opportunity for you to make a beeline to me. I want to ask a couple of our prayer team members, if you would, to come. And I want you to stand, just a couple of you on this side, maybe a couple over here on this side. Just come close to the cross, if you would. Audrey, I want you to come. Audrey is going to come, and she's going to pray in just a moment. But here's what I want to ask you to do, and here's my plea to you this morning. If you've truly not yet come to the cross, what are you waiting on? The cross is waiting for you. There's so much room, as the song says, at the foot of the cross. And I wonder right now, when Audrey begins to pray in just a few moments, I wonder how many of you this morning would be willing to say, it's me, Pastor Lee. I have truly not come to an understanding of the power and the significance of the cross. But today, I'm coming. I'm coming to get it right. I'm going to lay everything down at the cross this morning. These prayer teams are going to be waiting for you when you get here. Do you want to wait till after the service is over with? When everybody's gone? Do you want to make your way up here? That's totally fine as well. I just have a feeling. Somebody can't wait. Somebody really is feeling like Peter right now. And they got to get to Jesus. Jesus is waiting on you. He'll meet you. Just like the prodigal father. He ran to meet his son, didn't he? He'll run to meet you. Would you stand with me?
just know about the cross, know about you. God, let us know you. Help us to know you. God, let us never be like the disciples where you are standing in our midst and we don't even recognize you. God, I ask right now, Thank you. Have a wonderful day and we'll see you next week.